Welcome to the Journey of an Aesthete podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. time that we've talked right I think it's absolutely yes I, I, I think it's just been on uh, Facebook and messenger at this point yeah messenger but we've never spoken uh, verbally right and uh, so I, I, I basically know your your daughter much more than I know you because I've known her for like 12 years that's 12, true. 13 yes. years <laughs> and that's and that's a, under very unusual circumstances that's just being having gone to mass art film screenings you know as a Oh, that's someone interesting. Someone living in Boston. So right. if I wasn't a fan, if I wasn't a fan of Saul Levine and those kind of movies, I probably right. might never have met, might never have met Miley, <laughs> and then I would have never have met Shark Girl, read Shark Girl. So it's strange how the the connections between people. It's true, yeah. That it's it's really fascinating, kind of fun. <clears throat> I'm going to get a book here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a book here. I'm going to get. I'm. 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 I'm going to get vanishing acts. Oh, okay. Just get everything set up. So, um, this is Journey of an Esthete, which you know, and yes. you know our 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 theme is is all of the arts and the humanities. So it's yes. a it's a very it's a very broad and uh, and diverse uh, definition. Um, and so I'm really excited to have you on the show because you are a serious writer, fiction, prose. That is your, that is your beat. That um, is, yeah. That is your beat. And it's, it's great to have somebody who is a master at, at something on the show and that they, and that they, uh, we can go deep into the weeds as they say these days, right? And about, um, <laughs> what it, about, about both what it means to be a writer what prose means to you, uh, you know, what got you writing? You know, I know that, y y you know, your, your daughter is a, is a sound design person and, yeah. and, and visual artists. So this, so some of this, I mean, obviously artistic ability is, is partly genetic, at least a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. It runs in families, no? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So clearly that's the case. Yeah. Um, and so... I was thinking, usually what I have done is that I do, I start off with what I would call a linear chronology. Okay. And then out of that linear chronology, nonlinear things will start to happen. So because, <laughs> because you, you are the guest, um, you're going to, things are going to pop into your consciousness and the conversation okay. will go, you know, like kind of like uh, tributaries or water or things like that will happen. But so the linear chronology is sort of a foundation. Uh huh. So, that sounds great. So I can talk a little. I have to talk a little bit about myself um, because I discovered um, mainly uh, when I started taking reading this kind of this kind of writing that you're doing more seriously mm -hmm. would, would probably be as a very young teen, uh, young young teenager, right? And I was uh, as you, as we discussed, I went to Interlochen Arts Academy. <laughs> uh -huh. And the the person there was Jack Driscoll. I love that. Yeah. Jack, Jack Driscoll was he was somebody that every major loved. Like music majors that weren't necessarily very literate in terms of language. Uh -huh. and even they were clamoring to get into his class classes. Do, do you know what I mean? He was he was that kind of inspirational teacher. Yes, I I, I, I can definitely, definitely see that, that in him. him. <clears throat> and, and so I think this would have been 84, and he, he had a class, which I think is a, maybe a, a dated title for the class, but it was called Man's Search for Meaning. And that was the class everybody took, or a lot of people wanted to take. Right. Jack Driscoll, and I went in that class, and we opened up, we read, we read Jim Harrison's Farmer, uh -huh. which is a beautiful novel. Which I'm sure you, you know Jim Harrison's Farmer. Yes, I, yeah, and I, I know Jack is a fan of Jim, Jim Harrison. Harrison. Yes, yeah. definitely. 
And we read Ken. I think we start off with Ken Kesey of all things. I mean, we didn't start off with Tolstoy. Didn't start off with, you know, start off <laughs> right off the bat with Ken Kesey's uh, "One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest." Wonderful. With the first line, they're out there, and he would go into a deep kind of analysis of what of who's the they and what does it mean that they're out there, and really beautiful. And mm-hmm. I just I never really encountered up until that point. Um sort of the value of literature on that level in that one class. And of course the class was called Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, meaning, of course, is why the arts exist. Sort of making meaning. And then lo and behold, what is this? 20 years later, I'm reading this wonderful book called Shark Girls by you. Uh When when did Shark Girls come out? Um. Right at the end of 2009, and some sources have listed it, therefore, as 2010. It right. was right, right then in November. Yeah, so, um, and then it's Climbing the God Tree, and I think, uh, I think Molly said, you must read my mom's, mom's books, and so I, I, start, I started to read, I started oh. to read, I started to read uh, your work, and I read, I read Shark Girls on a long Amtrak trip. Actually, it's not so. It was an overnight type of thing. Uh-huh. I was coming. I live in Weaverville, North Carolina. I was this is back in nine. When I was probably visiting my mom, so I was going from Boston, Massachusetts, and taking that long, you know, yeah, the, the sleeper car actually. And I think the one of the few books I took with me was Shark Girl. So I read the entire book. I think on that. Oh, on great! That, on that on that trip, and um, but but that's getting too far ahead because in the, in terms of linear chronology, you'd want to go back to your origins as an artist, as a writer. So when you were a, a younger person, uh, what were the books you loved? Or maybe they weren't books. Maybe it was a movie. Maybe it was a TV show. Maybe it was a poem. What, well, how, did, actually, how did you come? It, it was books. Okay. It definitely was books. Um, I, I think it, I sort of started out with the, you know, the sort of more children's fantasy books like the, uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz, um, and in that case, I had, uh, when I was five years old, I had a very, very bad case of measles, oh. and I missed about probably half the year of kindergarten, and at that time, of course, well, of course, there was no measles vaccination at that time, oh, wow. and there were instructions to um, parents that if their children had measles, they had to be isolated, and they had to be um, in a dark room because of the correlation that, that could damage your eyes. So if you can imagine a five-year-old child having to stay away from her brothers and the rest of the family in her room with no lights on for the entire day, I, you know, needless to say, I was going a little crazy. And uh, my dad would come home huh. from work. And he would bring new Wizard of Oz books. And he he started out reading some of them aloud to me. That's beautiful. Um, Yeah, it was wonderful. And and then as I started learning, you know, more about reading myself, I ended up reading the entire stories of them as as a child. So I kind of grew into literature that way through, through the fantasy element. And then as I got a little older, discovered that I particularly liked realist fiction. Um, and now I, 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 I tend to, in my own writing, incorporate um, elements of magical realism, but I, I don't write fantasy. Yeah, I mean, these categories, I mean, these are, of course, very useful. Yeah. Sometimes when you're discussing writing um, in a more... Um, Show I don't know if the word in a more in depth way, right? Um, so so there's a truth to them, you know. That one one of the, one of the questions I really hate the most, and actually this this question has increased in the past eight years when people don't know me. Uh huh. They, they always ask me what style of music do I play. Oh, yeah. That question over like people. I remember when people didn't used to ask that. I would uh-huh. say I played piano and I did music, but there wasn't as that question didn't hover. Right. The non-musician. And so that's that tells me something. There's a there's a people um, today. I don't know if it's like they want to know if they want to spend their money on you or not, if waste their time, or if it's a style they like, or I don't know. It could be anything. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> there is a correlation in, in writing too. I mean, I, I get that kind of question is phrased like that. What, what kind, once they realize that I'm a fiction writer, well, what kind of books do you write or what kind of fiction? And I guess they are waiting to hear if I say something that rings a bell with them. If I say I'm a fantasy writer or science fiction, you know, they'll jump in with things that they like in those genres. It's a little harder to describe literary fiction, you know, and, and, and make it appealing to the average person who writes, who asks you that question. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a difficult issue because my relationship to the written word is very deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been reading books since, uh, you know, I was a very early reader and early to talk. I was early to yeah. do those things developmentally. And so I was, I was reading, you know, Orwell's 1984 as a child, uh, as a young child and, and things oh like that. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. And I actually wrote, you'll love this. I, I read, Marilyn French's The Woman's Room. Oh, my goodness. I read it when it came out. So that means I read it when I was eight or nine, right? In the set, in oh, wow. And so reading that, yeah. So reading that book gave me, but I didn't know when I was reading that. Yeah. It was for pleasure, actually. But I didn't know I was reading a, a woman's book or a feminist book. I didn't have that kind of conceptual apparatus. Right. It was just something around to read, and I learned something from it. So it's very, it's very interesting what you might discover, you know, things like that can happen. So I'd be reading Judy Bloom or reading Marilyn French or reading, and then high school I, uh, with Jack Driscoll, we read um, Jim Harrison and Ken Kesey. Or, 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 right. And then later on, uh, I read Tilly Olson's talk. I actually had a really good teacher. I took a, I took a summer extension class back in 88. Uh -huh. And the teacher was really smart. She actually repaired, get, you'll love this, two shorts, two Pieces of writing, Tilly Olson's Tell Me a Riddle, mm. and John Updike's Wife Wooing. Wow. So think about those back to back. Isn't that a great yeah. sort of masculine and feminine? They're like kind of ultimate. And we got, 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 is that something we got deep into both those things and discussed them? That's great. I think that's a sign of a good teacher. She's teaching both Wife Wooing and, and, and Tell Me a Riddle. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we watched the film version of Tell Me Your Riddle, which uh -huh. I think, which I think John Sales directed. Is that true? I don't know. It was a film version, I think, from eighty one or eighty two. Yeah, yeah. I would have to to revisit that. It's been a while. But anyhow, I'm getting too far ahead. But so so you were you were you were absorbing Frank Baum. I was, um, and and then you know ended up reading um, oh C. S. Lewis his trilogy uh -huh. and, and Narnia, all, all of those. But at the same time, I was being given Nancy Drew mystery books and, you know, the kind of child fare. Um, but, but it's interesting when I think now those were mystery books and the other was fantasy. So I guess we did have those classifications. But as a child, nobody says, here, I'm going to give you this genre of, of fantasy to read, or, you know, you just read and, and enjoy it all. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, of course, we need to, I need to ask you about geography, because from your fiction, and a little of I know of your biography, you, you traveled, right? You lived in different, so where, where would this have been when you were reading? Well, I, I grew up in, in Hawaii. I'm, I'm from Hawaii, so... You know, my childhood was was spent there, and that was an interesting reading experience because um, lots of the things that I read, of course, took place if, if they were, you know, United States of American writers and books. A lot of them took place on what we referred to as the mainland, and the mainland to me was just this sort of vague concept of you know the rest of the country. In fact. We weren't even a state until 1958. That's right. Um, yeah, in fact, I think I mentioned something about that in Shark Girls. So there, were, there was always this sense of reading all of these American authors as sort of foreign and really interesting. Um, when, just a, a quick little anecdote. When my mom took me to the mainland when I was 16, my, my parents really wanted me to go to a mainland college and, um, you know, to get the experience of a bigger world. And so when she took me looking at some colleges, we were at a, um, a little city park in Portland, Oregon, after looking at Reed College, 
And we had, she had a, she must have bought somewhere, you know, some picnic supplies. I don't remember, but we were having lunch on a picnic table. And I, I saw my first squirrel ever in my life at 16. And I went nuts over it because I had read, you know, all those stories that had squirrels in it when you're a child. And I kept pointing to my mom, a squirrel, and she was getting so embarrassed because people were staring, you know, here I am, a full grown young woman, you know, jumping all over and going crazy about a squirrel, but I had never seen one and they were in all the children's books. So So that's, that's a, that's a, but that's, that's an interest of your, your art, right? Because not to jump too far ahead, although we could get into it now, um, your art is very interested in the connection between human life and geology and, um, earth stuff, right? Yes. Topography. Yes. geography so that's that would be a case of living right living in Hawaii having different animals and different insects and, and um, absolutely than what um, and I, I'm sure there's some of that in your current novel but the figure of buddy yes it, it's um, because buddy's so interested in those things as a car- as yeah a character. it's a major theme of my and you know the more the more the world turns into, you know, real, real trouble with, with climate change, the more, the more I write about it, you know, it's just, um, the, the, the world that, uh, we have that's in danger, um, from the ravages of, of, you know, changing, changing climate, birds migrating too soon and not having the food that they want or too late or, you know, everything gets thrown out of balance. So, yeah, that, that is a real concern. Yeah, uh, I think, and so you, you, so you were basically experiencing a different, uh, different climate. A yes. Different, different, what you're calling mainland, I guess, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, Hawaii is the tropics and it's now getting quite hot. It wasn't, um, I was just back there in, in May um, and June, and it was really quite hot. And I remember those months, you know, from my childhood as just being delightful. It was still delightful, don't get me wrong, but just, you know, at least five degrees hotter every day. Wow. It's, it's a reality, and, I, and artists are going to yeah. respond to that. And, and pro stylists like yourself, uh, not just writers, but pro stylists, which to me is a, is a little more, um, more to it. Um, mm-hmm. are certainly going to want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, but so you're in Hawaii and I guess you, when do you, so when do you start doing your own writing or, or what's the next, next stage or step in the evolution of the written word and what it means to you or when, well, you want... I started out in, in poetry actually. And, uh, when I was in high school, I took a, a creative writing workshop and the, and the teacher was very, encouraging um you know she thought i had talent and she was really you know stressed that this might be something i would continue to do and so when i got into college i did take creative writing workshops but i don't think it actually occurred to me that i could make a career out of it um until you know maybe maybe right at the end of undergrad uh you know where was your where was your undergrad then it was at the University of Washington okay. in Seattle. And, you know, talk about a different climate. Wow, that's that was, a big change. <laughs> I felt like I went from, you know, beautiful sunny tropics to rain, basically. Um, it's still, it's beautiful, though. Washington State and Seattle was a beautiful city. But it, it was really hard to adapt to. And I was writing poetry at that point. And when I look back at some of those um Poems, the ones I didn't absolutely shred. <laughs> I, um, I I see the effect of the weather. You know, there, there's there's a, there's a grimness. There's not so many colors that I use in, in my fiction. Would, would you would you read any of your poetry now or today or on the show or no? Yes or no. Um, I would even have a hard time finding it. At oh, this okay. I saved a, a few of them, and um, I remember. Years ago, actually showing them to Miley and, and Ian, her her younger brother, yeah. um, with a lot of embarrassment, actually. Yeah. But both of them had been writing some poems, and I wanted to encourage them. So, and I, I'm not even sure what I what I did with them, but they they weren't 
they really weren't all that great, but I can see um, I can see the spark in them. I can, I can see the you know the interest in, in language and wanting to find the right image you know to, to bring bring about a visceral feeling in someone, even though a lot of it was was sort of awkward and even contrived mm-hmm. in places. you know I, I can see that now as, as a teacher myself, if I had been given, poems by a student like that, I, I would probably encourage that student, even though the poems weren't really ready for anything. Well, it's interesting to, to again, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a writer. Well, I am a writer, but I, but, but my writing is, is really been mainly nonfiction, which is almost its own, its own medium. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it is its own medium. I mean, there are connections, like there are people that, that write, not obviously write nonfiction with fiction tools, fiction stylistic devices, mm-hmm. but it is, it is sort of different. I mean, to me, one difference is that nonfiction is tends to be very propositional. Uh huh. Right. When you say that, I mean, fiction is not really propositional. I mean, fi- fi- fiction is, is a really a lot like poetry. Uh, is a lot, so what, what poems were you reading when you started writing poetry? What were the poets that you, that you My, were my absolute favorite poet. Yeah. Uh, was Theodore Redke, and I oh, still wow. love his poetry when I come across it. I just, um, there was, there's something in the way he used, um, you know, I- imagery along with, with his own experience, um, you know, some of his poems when he, he wrote about growing up in a, in a family that ran a nursery in a greenhouse, and just, you know, some of those poems were so were so visceral, and I, have, I think probably my poems got maybe a little better when I discovered him in the sense that I attempted to imitate him and couldn't successfully do that, but I think it, it upped the poems a notch. <laughs> so that's the, that's the major name that comes to mind. Yeah, he, he, was a, he was a big one. And then I, I, you know, I, I liked a lot of those 20th century modernist poets like mm-hmm. Sylvia Plath and... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just just some of the. Uh, I guess nowadays they would be considered more classic, um, you know, as opposed to contemporary. But but when I was reading them, they weren't contemporary. I mean, they were both actually in those two cases dead at that point. But their their writing was still pretty fresh. Well, it, it's an interesting again another interesting question about. Um how human beings categorize things or what, you know, is this classic? Is this modern? Is this? Yeah. Um, and I know that you experience that because your work is often categorized as experimental fiction. Is this true? Is it is true. Yeah. And I yeah. haven't, I have the faintest idea what we could get to that later. I actually don't really know what that means. I have to say, cause I've read, do you know, yeah. I've, I've, I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read, I haven't read all of your work, but I've read a lot, a lot of your work and I don't sit there thinking, Oh, this is experimental. Because because I, I'm sort of actually absorbed in these people's lives uh, uh, that you're writing about, and, and um, that's good in the prose, and it just doesn't seem. I don't know what people mean when they say it. I guess it probably has something to do with the way you organize chapters and and the way you and maybe of course there. I guess in your work is the question of the narrator, right? Or the tone yeah. of the narrator, which I guess is is considered radical because it's not an objective or it's not. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And I think a lot of it is is structure, as you as you pointed out, um, and and the shifting of the narrator and point of view. Um, I, I and I I agree. Experimental is sort of an arbitrary classification for you know maybe things that just don't fit into the standard either first or third person limited linear story, which is a lot of things that don't fit into that. Yeah, they, they, that's true. Um, and so you, you, you reading Sylvia Plath, but then something happens to make you write what short stories, right? Yes. Or yeah. maybe even an essay. I don't know. A lot of people I talked to people and they wrote essays and then went to fiction or they did. Well, you know what? That's it. That's that is actually really interesting. So um, in at the end of my undergrad, I did take a fiction workshop, and I was sort of surprised because I didn't. I didn't think I would know how to write a story, and I was sort of surprised when one just came out. But I still went to um, graduate school 
on based mo mostly on, on my poetry, but that was where I ended up um, really switching to fiction. I, I worked with John Hawks and oh, wow. poems and, you know, told him that I really, I, I had only written one story in undergrad, but I really, really wanted to write fiction. And I, I, I guess he saw, because the, the poems were narrative, he, he saw that there was a the possibility. But one of the first things he had me do, actually, was write a personal essay. Um, okay. He said that was the best way to, you know, get a sense of narrative flow and creating scenes and sort of working from your own memory and making connections that implicitly a story would do. But in, a, in an essay, you know, you you maybe think about it a little more. So he had me do that, and it was it was an eye opener. So John Haw Hawks is really the person that got you. Would you say he was a mentor at that time? Or? He was. He was definitely a mentor. And I think, you know, when I think back on, on teachers who really turned my career into, you know, into the direction it took and, and um, made me a writer, it, it would have been the, the teacher in high school, the, the poetry workshop teacher. But then I had another poetry workshop um, professor in undergrad, Nelson Bentley, who didn't have a huge reputation as a poet, but was one of those Jack Driscoll-like teachers who just, you know, he, he was just amazing. He, he, he did very unconventional things sometimes and, and then very conventional things and just opened mm -hmm. our eyes to the possibility of, of stories, basically. Even though he was talking about poetry, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. were being framed sort of as, as narratives. And, um, huh. and, uh, so, and then when I went to graduate school, it, it would have been John Hawks. So it's interesting that, I mean, the first, uh, first teacher was, was a woman, but the other two were, were male. And a lot of times people, you know, think, well, if you have a mentor, usually it's your, your same gender, but not, not necessarily. You said the first teacher was a... Yeah, she was a woman, and I'm trying to... You know, back then, we called her Miss Takahashi. That was her, her oh, last wow. name. I believe her first name was Diane. Oh. And then I know that um, right before I graduated, she she got married and changed her name, and I have no idea what her name is now. Um, I, I did, at one point, try to look her up because I wanted to thank her. But um, she disappeared with the name. Uh, that that's that's really fascinating. What years are we talking here? Just time period wise, when we would uh, the Hawks and and, and, Do and well, Diane. In um, gra I was in college undergrad, basically from um, 1969 to 1972, and then. Um, so you so we're talking a period a period of time that was relatively. Uh, you know, uneventful, um, Pacific, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of just, just yeah, sort of that, placid. That, that so, so, the, of time. so the, so the years and also the years are, have not, have not, uh, been remarked upon that much too. Um, no, I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's my, I'm not good at sarcasm, but maybe I am, yeah. but, but, uh, and particularly this year, of course, with the 50th anniversary of everything from that time period, um, it's, it's brought back some really poignant memories. So, yeah, in between protesting the Vietnam War, I was studying poetry <laughs> in, um, in college. And then I, I stayed out of school for a year and just worked. I actually um, moved down to San Francisco and, you know, worked and got in trouble and all the stuff you do when you're that age. And, and then decided that I did want to go to graduate school. And, and so it was... Um, the years that I was with Jack Cox were, I guess, roughly 1973 to 1976, somewhere, somewhere along. I, I mean, know. as you know, those are maybe you don't know, those are some of my favorite years. They are some of your favorite I mean, I'm, years. I mean, I'm a, I'm a 70s, 1970s historian. I'm a lay historian, admittedly, but I take it pretty seriously. Um, so, Fabulous. I, yeah, so... Have you, by any chance, have you read the um, the letters of Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell? I have read some of them. I never actually read 
read the book, but I have come across them, okay. you know, in other ways. And they are both actually, I should have mentioned them too. They were also very influential, you know, to me in poetry. I loved both of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what is it, the Robert Lowell poem about um, about my wife, my old flame, my wife? Like, oh, yeah. It's an amazing poem. That is, I mean, yeah. I always tell, you know, I, in my dad's, at my dad's um, funeral in 2011, I read uh, One Art, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art. At that, oh. Which is Wait, one of my favorite he, poems ever. Did he love Elizabeth Bishop as well? No, just the, just the content, the theme, just that yeah. poem. If you yeah. know One Art. That's uh, great. Um, it's um, so you st so what? May I ask what your personal essay was? Are you, uh, are you, yeah, you it it um, I don't remember the the title, but it was based on um, <laughs> actually an incident um, that happened to me. I was probably a freshman, maybe in high school, maybe even a little younger than that. Um, in a, in a uh, oh the the girls' bathroom at a at a football game. Oh boy! Where I was surrounded by you know a group of older girls and there was some for the most place Hawaii is a very easy place where different you know races um, are are together. There isn't there isn't the aspect of, of racism you know, that, that we have in, in the rest of the country so much. In fact, it's the one place where, oh, for about at least a decade, the uh, babies, there were there are more babies there being born of mixed race than they are of any single race. So generally it's an easy place, but there, there were some tensions, and these were a group of, you know, local, local girls from um, a different school, Part, part Hawaiian, part, you know, lots of other things. And I went to, I went to the same school that President Obama went to. Oh, you did? Punahou, yeah. So it, it, it was a school that, you know, created a lot of, um, oh, you know, among others who didn't go to it, there was a sense that if you went, you were elite and snobby and, and, and at that time a, a lot Caucasian but that very much changed I, that's definitely the minority race at Punahou or, or anywhere else pretty much in in Hawaii at this point but at that time things there was a little tension so I wrote about that I, I wrote about my my fear and you know what happened which was nothing nothing at all you know just this this sort of sense of I think they wanted to make me feel afraid and, and see that, and, and that was, and, and that was all they you know needed to do. But in my memory, it was a very big, big deal. So, and I wrote about that and brought in race relations and you know things a little bit like that. But this, but the story part was what Jack Cox was very interested in, and you know just the teaching me how you can go into a scene like that and, and remember it. But fictionalize it as well. So you're moving, you're writing this piece of, uh, you wrote this piece about your own experience, this memoiristic essay. Yeah. And you're interested in this other part of it. You're interested in the story. Exactly. Or, and and then then what happens? You you. Do you write a fictional piece after that? I do. I do. And I started out with what um, nowadays people call short shorts or microfiction. Okay. Um, mostly because I didn't I wasn't confident um, to enough to develop a longer story yet. And he was fine with those, you know, and I think um, they were definitely instructive. In fact, I generally start my my own um, workshops that I teach here at Binghamton University off with the, the uh, little micro fictions or short shorts as well, and then we move into the <clears throat> the longer stories. So I started out with those, and eventually they grew because he would talk to me how I could develop them, you know, how you could move a character through other scenes and, and have it go someplace. 
And the, and the result of that was what? You we, Did you uh, start getting published or? or I got, um, yes, I, I had actually one fairly big publication that came out of a story I read in that class. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name. It's funny, I remember the name of the magazine, <laughs> the journal, but I don't remember the name of my story in it. Um, it was Tri-Quarterly, which, um, ah, yeah, I that, that. that was a, a very, very, and I, I guess it still is, it's gone online, but, it, yeah. you know, it's, um, so, but then I had quite a long dry period, years, <laughs> so there's sometimes a sense, and, you know, it might be the same in, in, in music and, and the arts in general, that, you know, if you, if you, if you do something that feels fairly big, in your career that you've made it that it, you know, one thing after the other, it's just going to all open up. And of course, you know, that's, that's not necessarily true. And it certainly wasn't um, for me. I think it, it, it took quite a while for me to, you know, start publishing again. And then when I did, it was, it was a little more regular in literary journals. Well, Tri-Quarterly tri was, a, was a big name, was it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, wasn't yeah. Tri-Quarterly um, the equivalent of, say, in the past 20 years, Raritan, maybe? Dick, Dick Poirier, Poirier's... Uh, well, I think now T. Jackson Lears does Raritan, but um, it's that kind yeah. of um, almost a highbrow type publication. I don't know. Was it? Yeah, and, and it's interesting because it, it was, um, you know, when you getting back to the experimental writing thing, it was known for publishing um, writers who, who were more experimental. Um, I didn't think of this piece that I did as necessarily experimental, and nobody labeled it one way or the other, but they took it. And, of course, Jack Fox's work in general was, you know, was definitely, um, was definitely more of a pro-stylist approach to... I, I remember for him... Language was everything. Language was first, plot was second, and maybe even last, depending on the piece that yeah, he was well, working that's, on. That's true. That makes sense. I mean, uh, because it's a medium made up out of language. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. not. It's not sculpture. You know, it's not. A, it's not someone dancing. Uh, it's. Uh, it's using its words. So I, I would think. I would think that things like syntax are, are really important. Yep. Yep. What you do with the um, what you do with those words and and how you put them together. He he was very much um, into creating, you know, very very beautiful and startling sentences and language on the. I guess that's probably why he was willing to take me on as a fiction student, even though I had been accepted. In poetry, he must have seen, you know, that concentration of language. So, you had so you you published in Tricordia, and then you had this period that was would you call it fallow, or you said dry? Yes, it was definitely <laughs> fallow. And when this what what was happening in the nineteen seventies? What music were you listening to, or or what was uh, at that time, or what I don't know, just what what was happening? Anything that comes to mind that's important to you to talk about? Well, it, the 1970s it was an interesting time period because um, coming out of, you know, of course, post-Vietnam War, I mean, for, for that period while I was in college, we were still in the Vietnam War. Um, I was definitely protesting it, and uh, as were a lot, of, a lot of students and a lot of people. And the music then was... You know, a lot of the, the kinds of music that people are, are still listening to um, that you associate with that, that era, anything from Bob Dylan to the Stones to, you know. Um, but then after that, after graduate school, I know that I still, gosh, what, what was it? I think for, for a while the, um, oh, there the, the disco trend, which I didn't care for, I didn't care for the yeah. disco music. Um, but then there was more of the punk, the punk uh -huh. scene, uh -huh. the punk rock, and I did like that yeah. very much. Um, so I was listening to that, and uh, but I think the other thing that was happening in 
the late seventies to me personally was, you know, I got married and was having children. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, you know, that, that, took up, that took up a lot of my, my concentration, but it was also a little frustrating to me that it's sort of at the same time, and, you know, any, any woman of that generation or even a, a few generations beyond that would relate to this. It did sort of derail my, um, I, I was still writing kind of um, journal entries, you know, that sort of thing, but I wasn't seriously sending my work out or, you know, I, I thought that um, I had always wanted to teach in a creative writing, you know, capacity myself to teach in a, in a creative writing program. And, and I, that was the part I thought might have been derailed. But I did end up doing adjunct teaching and, you know, I sort of found a way to keep myself in it, even though for only part time. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Well, that, that's interesting because the... the uh the material, raw material in your work, I think at least everything that I've read, um, Stalking God Tree, mm -hmm. um, Shark Girls, and, and certainly Vanishing Acts, which is really, which I really love, um, is all material about family life, intimate life. I mean, not totally, but a large yeah. part uh, of, um, am, I, am I right about that? So, that, so, so the, maybe there's a sense in which... Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think, yeah, you, you are right. I, family dynamics is a, is a big interest of mine, and, and um, <laughs> most people look at my, you know, books and they say, well, yeah, all dysfunctional families, but, mm. you know, that's, that's, that's what makes fiction and families in, in some ways, even though difficult to live that way, interesting to write about, you know, how, how people come around problems such as alcoholism or, you know, the, the sorts of things that create um, a, a troubling dynamic in, in families. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so in a sense, these things, these um, experiences in your personal life, I guess I'm saying it's a, it's really important. And, yes. And, and, uh, uh, but also important in the sense it's kind of a, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the phrase. It's almost a win-win. It's almost a, um, am I, you know, it seems like it's something there to that. Yeah. It's something yeah. good it's, because it it's it, it sort of, there's a, so, 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 so there could be a sense of being derailed, but there's also could be a sense in which you're actually on a train going somewhere that there's a, right, that there's the train is not derailed. Um, yeah, I think that, that's that's actually a really good analogy. But you're you're on it, but you don't necessarily recognize it at the time. But I think something in me must have recognized it because I did when when my kids were babies and I really didn't have time to sit down and write a story. I did do journaling, and then by the time they um, they were older and, you know, went to nursery school or, or whatever, whatever, I tended to do my, my teaching at night. I would take whatever times of the day they weren't um, around and, and write. So I really, I was, I was continuing to write. I just, um, it took me a while to start sending my work out again um, and, and publishing and, you know, getting, feeling like you're, seriously involved in, in a career track. So is that, is that the, is that the world and that world, is that the period out of which stalking the God tree emerged? That was actually, um, a little later than that, that okay. book and my first book, which is harder to get a hold of now since it's out of, out of print. But that book, the, the first book was sex, salvation and oh. love. Um, automobile and that was in in 94 and then um the god tree was in um let's see i think that was 
97 or 98, it was about four, four years after. And those two books, actually, those books were published um, by winning national competitions. And that's how they, you know, they got into the world. And at that point, because of those books and because of the competition um, wins, I was able to start applying to um, to teach in, in college, which I had been doing as an adjunct, but now I was taken a little more seriously, and I got some visiting writer positions. And but at that point, the kids were, um, you know, they they were in in college and graduated from college, and it was just a uh, it was an easier time for me to you know go back and and put one hundred percent effort into pursuing writing. I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's climbing the god tree. It's climbing the god tree, and I, I, I that was the first I read. Oh, that's I think, okay. Yeah. I think that's the book. I think that's the book that Miley told me to read. Yeah, um, that that would be probably yeah, yeah. And, and she, she was actually my kids were very, very supportive of me doing this. Even yeah. even yeah. if sometimes you know when they were teenagers, I was locked away in my den. But you know, obviously when they they needed me, they were. They were able to to have me, but um, those were the books that really really did set me on a on a career path. So it just it just took a little longer, is all. Well, it, um, I had thought that maybe uh, when when you feel uh, comfortable, uh, you have a you have an excellent speaking voice. Oh, thank you. So, how do you feel about reading uh, reading excerpts from your fiction? I would be happy to because uh, again, there's a of course there's a lot here, and for the audience that doesn't know, well, in general, if you know somebody who's never approached your work, um, what would you say? So, I, uh, climbing the God Tree, Shark Girls, um, there was uh, Dream Lives of Butterflies. Dream Lives of Butterflies. Um, that's right. Yeah, that was. Uh, let's see, that was right before. Shark Girls. That was a couple of years before Shark Girls, and and those were um, those were linked stories. Um, so yes, for for an audience who doesn't know, what is a linked story, and what does that mean in terms of a, a form? If, if somebody doesn't doesn't know quite, how would you explain? Yeah, that's what actually that is? a specialty of mine, as it turns out. That's right. You're known you're known for this, but for for the yeah, uninitiated, yeah. what what is that? Well, it, it's it's sort of the um, it's kind of the, the crossbreed between the novel and a story collection. You know, a story collection might have some kind of a, you know, vague theme or focus that makes the stories feel like they, they fit. And with a, a linked story collection, um, it, it's a little bit more deliberate. Um, a lot of times, for instance, with Dream Lives of Butterflies, most of the stories and the characters who repeated in each other's stories um, were took place in St. Louis in a in an apartment complex, and they there was sort of the metaphor of these you know characters walking on these paths that connected the buildings of the complex, but ultimately the paths were also connecting their lives you know however tangentially so. There, there's that aspect with climbing the god tree, um, which you might remember. There was a an incident that happened um, where a um, there had been a crime committed. Uh, a you know young woman was murdered, and the the person who did it is in this prison in this town. And the the character Ellie comes it's, it's and works as a part. Teaching, uh, that's right, teaching in the prison in Maine, correct? Right, right. So there's stories that spring out of this this thing that happens, and once again, they're, they are mostly located in this fictional town in, in Maine. So you, you can see kind of there's a novelistic sense in these things, but it doesn't have to, you know, all stories don't necessarily need to build to um, a final Climax. Um, they they might to a certain extent, a little bit. In my um, my more recent book, Wild Things, which is a um, 
I would also describe as linked stories. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't always set out to do that. A lot of times I'm just writing stories, but there is something in my interest and, and just in my brain, I guess, an approach to things that wants to find connections and things. So, right. you know, they end up being connected. And in wild things, there's also a crime that, that happens, an abduction. But it's not a um, – the, the, the person who does it is more of a Billy Budd kind of a character. He's, he's not – a dangerous criminal. He, he believes he's actually doing it to protect this girl. And, and, and it's all sort of wound up with nature. And, you know, he, he takes her to, he, he loves nature and he takes her out to this um, trailer in, in the woods mm. that is also very isolated. So there's a, a scary factor, but there's also, you know, constantly the beauty of nature that is, that is surrounding this. And the stories sort of link around that as well. Well, that, that's beautiful because there's common themes and characters and hearing you describe wild things, I'm thinking about your current novel, Vanishing Acts, yeah. which involves, you know, crime and inhumanity, certainly, right? Yeah, I guess that and is interesting. Like, <laughs> well, no, but, 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 but yeah, yes, but there's a, there's a meaning to it. So it's not, yeah. it's it really, one of, it's very hard to articulate for me. Um, it's, it's, um. It's almost as if you, you're taking – and you do the same thing actually in your prose because uh, if, if I may stick uh, now to Vanishing Acts, um, mm -hmm. um, the prose uses as its raw material the actual lives of the characters in the book. So, the, um, so there's a complete refusal of any or all objectivity. Right? Yeah, um, and I and I say objectivity as someone that actually thinks that's kind of doable and possible, personally. Uh -huh. But for the sake of the discussion here, let's pretend like it's just an artificial. I'm put. Let's put it in quotes. In other words, um, uh, a certain of omniscient narrator. Uh -huh. You you sort of demolish that in your work, and the narrators have the ex lived experience of the people in your book. So they live in the town that the people live in, and they and actually, it's also vernacular. So there's mm -hmm. there's pop references, and uh, even in the language, it's you really so it's almost it's it's really quite something. And so what what I what I would say is that that's a strength in your writing, because it's actually like it's almost like you're entering the consciousnesses of the characters, and the yes. conscious the consciousness of the characters is filled. With, you know, like products they would have to buy at a store or wiki watchy or I don't know what. I'm just thinking out loud. Like, uh -huh. like uh, you know, uh, details about their, about, about their lives. Do you understand what I mean? So it's not – there's not this separation right. between, uh, between so-called omniscience. Right, right. And sort of character. And so in a sense, it's like purely subjective, Right. Right. In a positive sense, purely subjective. In other words, what you're implying philosophically is that all is subjectivity. It's almost like is that is that kind of a weird but then you but see, but then in addition to that you have this the intractability of wild nature, earth and geography, which is both always changing. Uh-huh. It's always changing. At the same time it's not changing, it's a constant, like a foundation. Mm -hmm. And so the characters will be in a situation when they say, well, this is what the earth felt like on that particular day. Like Mar Marge, Margot, or Gwen always mm -hmm. make a point to say, this is what this felt like in terms of what the natural environment was and where I was. So it's really, it's really interesting. Did I, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to, I'm thinking out loud here. So if I haven't, if I haven't um, expressed it uh, as uh, accurately as I could, but. No, I, I I think that's very accurate. I I'm glad to um, you know I'm glad to hear that that you've you've picked up on that because that is certainly important to me. I mean I think that's the way a lot of my own memory works, which also of course informs fiction writing. Is is you remember things in a visceral way through the senses. I'm always trying to get my students to you know, give us sensory details because that's also the way a reader enters the piece. You know, you, by, by saying, I expressed how a character 
feels on the earth that day. You know, that, that's the sort of thing that helps a reader say, okay, well, the character is, is feeling this way and I'm feeling it as well. Yeah, and you, and you do it in your prose, but you do it um, so consistently um, so that it's, there's never, you never, you're never not doing it. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> but is that the quality in your work that makes it lab- get people put labels on? Is that what's unusual? Again, I don't know. It's hard for I, me to – my perception is a little – but I, I imagine your, 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 your um, shall we say, uh, alternative views of narration is part of it, right? Yes. Like the, yeah. like the tone or the you know, kind of the – well, you can – do you want to read parts of Vanishing Acts? I mean I, one of the things I, 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 I'd like the listener to experience – is how you enter uh, the voice of these very different characters. Oh, yeah. Like, for example, Buddy is very much a masculine voice. He's, he's, a, right. buddy, he's a budding entomologist, right? Right, and he's, right. He's, I love he's, that he's part. Complaining, <laughs> he's complaining about his girlfriend. He has a really, I guess they would say, problematic relationship. Yes. But then yes. again, you enter the girlfriend with such a, it just so so I guess it would be good maybe if you could if you don't mind um, to sort of uh, read sections of some of these very differing characters I, I'd be happy so, to so, cause it's show, show, show the audience that you really understand you really understand the people you're writing about you really it's, which is um, I guess that's what writers want to do right that's gets important to them to try to do that it's very very important you know I think that's one of the uh both the wonderful and to a lot of people daunting aspects of, of writing a novel, you end up living with these characters so deeply that there are times when you feel like your head is more in their world than the real world. You yeah. know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that I need my summers. A lot of times I will go, I will have a writing residency or, or something where I can just concentrate on doing that because it doesn't um you know to, to be able to inhabit a, a, a made-up character's voice and consciousness it it, it, it takes some doing <laughs> well it, le- it leads me to believe that they're not really that made up of course that's that's a philosophic question right because as you know there are um english critics uh i don't mean british english i mean you know cr- critics of, of uh english um who think that it's all made up so people right. tend to go around and around and that it's all a function of the language or it's all – and I tend to get away from all of them. Right. I don't yeah. tend to enter into it, that, into that um, um, debate. I mean I have my own opinions about it. And if you ask me, I might answer, but it might not be important to me. Yeah. You know, I mean I do think it is um, – it is the job of of a fiction writer and I think that what makes a story successful – is that we we have to bring a character to life to the point where that character doesn't feel made up. You know, the, the, the character feels, that Buddy feels like a living entity, a, you know, living, very bright, a little bit awkward um, teenage boy who loves his girlfriend more than she loves him back. I mean, you know, that the, the kind of things that people hopefully would understand Right. When you read Buddy, hopefully somebody would be getting that, you know, that he's drawn that in that real sense. And also your chapter headings, like you'll have Buddy, then you'll have Buddy again, and then you'll have yeah. an interruption, you have Gwen, then the next chapter is about Houdini, and, and then you have um, some of the, and you, and you combine, you know, Jody Johnstone is just the, the, the father right, in this family. Right, is, is this yes, like, he's, is, he's the disappearing father of Gwen, and I found him absolutely fascinating. <laughs> well, he's a, he's a spectral influence, but you use these yeah. chapter headings that are almost like titles in a movie. Yes, exactly. They're, but they're not yeah. but they're not titles in. So the kind of movies I'm thinking of is like Godard. Right. Are you? Yeah. Kind of, it's like a Jean Luc Godard movie, not like a studio Hollywood film. So <laughs> I, I guess you could say that's experimental, right? That they're using that you're using that kind of collage. Yes, I, I think that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and that was exactly the reason that you were saying he is a very spectral influence as far as his family is concerned. 
he's um, he's dead. They believe that he he vanished in um, in the surf, in, in the really high surf. Um, other than Madge, who has always believed that he's pulling one on her. <laughs> so. Mm. <laughs> so what comes into your mind that you would like to read? I mean, again, my, my only uh, simple request is that it would be uh, more than one voice, maybe Buddy, maybe Madge, I don't know. What uh, what uh, Do you have anything there that you'd want to like to read? Well, let's see. Are there any... Um, was there a particular section of words that you that you liked? And I guess also I, I would have to ask: um, Are we talking of maybe a page from each character, or what was your thoughts here? Oh, I would think uh, maybe a page. I mean, again, this is a pretty long form type of show, right? Um, so I don't want to I don't want to give short shrift to anybody or anything. Maybe something something that really gets into the. Uh, interiority of a person like maybe buddy buddy's uh, desire as a male maybe or maybe i don't know maybe maybe if you could do it you could also do a scene you know the scenes of the of the women in the family mm -hmm. and the nursing the question about the nursing home again i don't want to give i don't want to give too much away about the novel but um there's just a lot there so I, i'm going to defer to your judgments you're the you're the author you can, okay. You can, you can. Well, I, I, I sort of I turned here to um, to page fifty one, which okay. uh, gives us Buddy and a little bit of Mad or not Mad, a little bit of Marnie, his girlfriend, for yep. a couple pages, and then there's a, a section after that on on Gwen. Mm -hmm. Gives us Gwen's frustration dealing with Madge. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I could do that. Absolutely. A couple, a couple pages or so for, yes. for each. Is that about right? Do you think? That's uh, more than right. That's perfect. So, so. Okay. Take it away, oh, Jamie. Yes, yes, yes. So I will go ahead. So this mm -hmm. is this is chapter six, buddy. Mm -hmm. After that night in the Palm Gardens Motel, they had spent the next on Cujillo Beach. Marnie was beyond pissed. No money for food. Hiss of the waves sliding up on the shore. Go home, go home. Todd, Marnie's lunatic uncle, was in Trickler Hospital for a treatment, and his hippie pals were using his place for the night. Marnie refused to stay there with his friends. I'm a model, she said. I don't spend the night with wasteoid freaks. You're a fuck up, buddy. You know that, right? You think the cops will come after us for stiffing that taxi? Buddy asked her. He was too busy being stunned at the sudden and savage detour his life had taken. A train derailing, taste of its burnt metal at the back of his throat, to worry much about what she was thinking of him. At least at that point. First he's a thief, then a runaway, now he's a fugitive? How the hell could a $50 bill just disappear? That night on Cohio, he had looked at Marty suspiciously, her profile unyielding as some goddess in the moonlight, stony and severe. He concluded she wasn't the type to bring misery on herself by making any money disappear. If she stole it, they wouldn't be sitting there together. Hello, Dud, they'll be after you. They'll catch you and lock you up in the bad boys' home. Ever seen it? They work them in the hot sun all day, and at night the mafos throw raking parties. So there's a place where it's better to give than receive. Wouldn't you agree, buddy? Of course, funny thing about that. Remembering all of this now, lying beside Marnie on a mattress at Todd's place, he works in the hot sun all day in the goddamn pineapple fields, and at night she turns away from him like he's some kind of leper. Sometimes he imagines just doing her, rolling over on top of the clothes, the sheets, the shoes she has piled up between them, and taking her like his grandmother's money, that easy. He's feeling weird about that money at this point, and really weird about his grandmother. The money just flat out disappeared. Maybe she put some kind of curse on him for stealing it? That night on Kuhayat Beach, he had reached Marty's hand. He needed the press of something real to soothe his fear and another headache coming on. The pain was ebbing and flashing directly behind his right eyeball, keeping time with the rhythm of the waves, flash in, slide out, in, out. She swatted his fingers like he's a fly. No dudes ever made me sleep in some beach park. 
and you want to hold hands, do I look like a wino buddy, some pathetic loser? Do I push my life around in a foot foodland basket, for Christ's sake, mumble sweet nothings to my 15 fucking selves? Well, sorry, he muttered, collapsing down on the sand, pressing his head into its grainy coolness. He wanted to cry, but no way would he give her that satisfaction. Shut his eyes and pretend to sleep, pain ripping through his head like the gales in there. And then he guesses he did sleep, world-famous Waikiki Beach fading out behind him, sigh of its surf. So I can move on to the Gwen section now. Wow. Well, just give me a little time. Yeah. That's okay. Actually, that's, <laughs> well, um, that's really, that's a really, um, really, I say emblematic example of your, of your prose mm-hmm. and what you do. It's really, it makes me think you're, you're, what occurs in there is actually so much a part of so many people's lives. Um, do you know what I mean? In terms of time, you think about a yeah. average person's time and, what they experience. I mean, not the exact same thing, but so, but those years are something like that. Yes. And it's really, it's it's something to think of that that, that writers would not want to take that seriously and delve into that. It, it would be kind of kind of strange, you know. Um, right. And, 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 uh, and you do so there. It's really, it's really, um, it's really beautiful. So you're, you're, uh, you're, you're going to uh, read from what part of, um, is it a, so what I thought I would read then is, is from Gwen, his mother. Um, actually, the very next chapter that begins on uh, chapter 7 on page 60. 60, yep. Yeah. And she's, of course, um, Buddy has run away, mm-hmm. and she has her hands full. Oh, she's, yeah. she's dealing with her mother, who is you know sort of losing her grip on reality from all these TIA strokes. Um, that has created a, a sort of dementia. And so Gwen is, is very both concerned and irritated and frightened um, having to take care of her mom while at the same time just being absolutely beside herself that her son has run away and she doesn't see a way to get him home that wouldn't involve police and making her son resent her for the rest of his life. There's always, there's already problems there. Mm. Plus she's in the middle of a divorce and she's worried that, you know, her husband would use it against her. So she is just having a really hard time. (laughs) So this, I'll read a couple pages from, from that chapter, which also brings Madge up a little bit, her mother. That's right. Gwen tugs Madge off the chair like she's a rag doll and begins dressing her. For crying out loud, mother, you got bones in your legs? Madge squeals, wriggles, curses, but Gwen's grip is firm. Well, that's an ugly shirt. I don't look good in ugly clothes. Now, wouldn't you think that fashion is the last thing we ought to be concerned about here, hmm? Gwen shakes her head, stares at her mother. The sagging skin on Madge's forearms hangs out of the sleeveless top like two elephant trunks. Jesus Christ, Gwen mutters, with respect. The pain of Buddy's leaving suddenly punches her hard. She sucks in a ragged breath. I think I need a drink. With Madge in tow, Gwen heads toward the kitchen, Madge wagging her finger. It's a little early, don't you think? Look around and tell me, is anyone missing? Am I a mother without a son here? Nothing is too early when your child is gone. I said I need a damn, excuse me, drink. <clears throat> Madge snaps. So drink then. Just what do you think you're doing with me? She yanks at Gwen's hand around her wrist, makes a motion to unfur- unfurl it like dough. We're going out. That's what I'm doing with you. Since lately you've been acting like a child, I get to treat you like one and hold on to you. She pours her wine and lugs Madge out the door. Guide her firmly, Dr. Alvarez said, but don't yank. This when Gwen tried to haul her mother out of her office after Madge engineered a sit-down strike on her doctor's desk. Remember, inside a person afflicted is an adult who's known a lifetime. What if Buddy falls? Shouldn't you be at home? You don't have a cell phone. I can't afford a cell phone here. We're just going to take a little drive, that's all. I thought it would be nice, and I need to get out of this house for a bit. You need it. You, you, you. 
Gwen sips from a plastic cup filled with burgundy tart in her throat, plodding the familiar path, Madge pinching her arm. Okay, mother, we need it. She fires up the Mustang after they settled inside. The motor roars, sputters, chokes, and stalls. Then she does it again. Jesus, mother, you ever get this thing tuned up? Hmm. Madge sits in the passenger seat, brittle as straw. Gwen backs slowly out the dirt driveway, then heads up the road. Um, should I read more of that, or does that give you a sense of that chapter? Oh, so you don't want to go on, she rubs her aching forehead? Jesus. I said, come on, yeah. I, I said, well, on we, 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 the road that they're traveling on, because that gives us a little bit of the description of Mauna Loa and the area that they yes. live in, which is very important in yes. the book. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. She rubs her aching forehead. Jesus, she whispers again, more like a plea. Her eyes burn and her stomach hurts. What she really wants to do is to curl up and sleep, pop two Xanax, maybe three, dreamless. She places her hand tentatively on Madge's leg, quivering in the passenger seat like something caged. Is she frightened? Gwen peers over at her mother's eyes, gazing stonily ahead out the window. Hello? She waves her hand in front of Madge's face. No sign of life. Is she prepping for a catastrophic reaction? Dr. Alvarez's term for when the way Madge can have a flat affect one moment, then suddenly she's grotesquely excitable and paranoid over who knows what. They pass the bird park on the Mauna Loa Strip Road, then continue winding as far up the mountain as you can get in the car. On both sides, there are groves of koa trees, slim young ones, and the huge towering 100-foot variety Hawaiians built their canoes from. Leaves are silvery and shimmer in the rare air that becomes sweeter and thinner the higher up they drive. They pass ohia trees with fiery red lehua blossoms, Pele's flowers growing abundant in the old broken-up lava flows, Pele, the Hawaiian volcano goddess, life among the ruins. Gwen stares out the windshield at the landscape, thinking how foreign she feels, feels to it, how out of place and out of touch with everything she once loved. A bitter taste on her tongue, blinking back tears. Buddy! Madge's eyes remain fixed ahead. Gwen parks the truck at the top of the road, shuts off the engine and climbs out, then reaches in and slides her mother to the edge of the seat, carefully lowering her legs to the ground. Madge's once shapely calves are tent spikes now, spindly and bent. She makes a huh sound, scowls at Gwen. Leave me be, what's wrong with you, she sputters. With Madge's hand locked firmly into Gwen's, they stroll over to the edge of the old pavement where a trail begins, shards of green olivines glittering in the dirt. Spread out below is Kilauea, its crater stark above the cloud line. A quilt of clouds stretches over the rest of the island, a slap of violet water, ocean beyond. Pu'uo'o steams in the distance. Gwen sucks in her breath. The raw beauty of this land always made her long for something, and she's not even sure what. But there's that familiar ache. How about uh, that stopping place? <laughs> well, thank you. That's, that's beautiful. Um, well, the novel is Vanishing Acts. It's uh, Jamie Riston Colbert. Everybody should go out and get this book. <laughs> I recommend <laughs> it to everybody. Um, it's published, it's Unusual Publishing Company, right? Fom Fomite, yeah. Fomite. Um, and people can get that on Audible or they can get it uh, at a physical bookstore. Um, and uh, they ought to because it's really worth it. There's a lot here. It's, um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a novel about so many things. I mean, the, the, the scene that you just read, is, again, is something that um, um, has, has a universality to it, right, in terms of human experience of what, of what Absolutely. people, of what people um, I think people have to deal with in their own families in life. Right, um, right. So I think that I think that that makes it makes it very valuable. Is there any, anything else you want to say about this novel or about for my publishing company or, or? Well, just about that that particular um, scene, which you know, I think the um, the last paragraph that I read ex expresses one of the themes that I think is fairly traditional in in a lot of fiction 
um, you know, which is you can't go home again, which is what Gwen is trying to do when she, you know, she 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 busts up her marriage in Maine and and takes Buddy to to the Big Island of Hawaii where where she grew up and, and where her mom is having these problems, and she feels like she just can't fit in anymore. You know, she sees the landscape that that is the landscape of her childhood and always, you know, as, as she expresses, it always makes her feel something, but she's just, she can't quite put her finger on, on the feeling. It, you know, it's that, that sense of longing and maybe aloneness. And she feels that, she, she battles that the whole time she's back home in Hawaii. And of course she she turns to less healthy ways of dealing with that, but I think are, are very human as well. She turns to her alcohol and, and Xanax bottle um, a little too often. <laughs> yes. Um, that's a, that's an, that's a, that's a, well, it's a good summary because we're getting it from the writer who wrote it there, <laughs> which is a, which is all too rare these days. Uh, people like to weigh in on all sorts of things when they, I, they don't really often have the um, the most uh, how do I put this politely. They're not often the most skilled interpreters or uh, of, right. of what it is they're talking about. So right. <laughs> in this case, we have it from from you. Is there anything else uh, uh, you want to say about either about this book or about what you want the reader uh, to think about, or you could talk about Hawaii or anything. Well, I, I will say actually something about this book that you know, I think people working in the arts would 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 probably um, like to hear, and, and you know, I think maybe have a similar experience. This book was actually um, I, I would almost call it a problem child for me in the sense that I conceived of it initially way back in the nineties. Wow. And I and I, I would attempt to write it. I wrote a couple drafts, and it just um, I I it, I couldn't quite get it right. I had um, at different times in my life since then, I had you know a couple different agents try to sell it to no avail. Um, it just there there was something. And I, and I think probably what happened a lot, too, was I would start getting ideas for other books, and they would become more immediate and pressing. And so I would work on other books, and, and it would kind of languish. And um, at one point, you know, I would say, oh, I don't know, five, six years ago or, or, or thereabouts, I got the idea of um, Jody Johnstone. And before, in the in previous drafts of the book, he he really only existed as a catalyst for the book. He didn't, you know, it, it, the book always started out with that that prologue um, where you know the, the the memory that Madge and Gwen have of the father, particularly Madge going out with his surfboard on a day of wild surf and never coming back again, you know, was, was always kind of the, the crux of, of things in the book, but then everything moved past that. And, you know, the family dynamic became, um, more important and immediate, but always colored by the sense of this disappearing father. And I got the idea of Jody Johnstone as, a disappearing father who maybe hadn't really disappeared. It's just that everyone thought he did. And, and this, and so he, he came to life for me and I had so much fun writing his sections that I, I think the book took off as a result. You know, you have to, when you work on a novel for a while, you really have to have fun with it. If it starts feeling like a drag, it's going to drag for the reader as well. You know, it really, um, so, once I, I got his character and started rewriting it, it just um, it, it became very immediate and compelling to me, and and that's when when the book worked. Well, it's compelling to it. It was compelling to me as I as I read it, and I really, I, <laughs> I really appreciated having you on this show. You were an excellent example of what my show's about. 
Oh, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you in your that. practice. And um, I do hate saying goodbye, of course, um, but all things come to an end. Um, right. And I wanted to thank you for being on Journey of an Esthete. And thank you so much for the invitation. Yes, and it's really, it's really always a real treat to have someone that uh, works in the art of prose, um, which is uh, something that a lot of people take for granted. People read a lot, but um, you know, to uh, to talk about it in a, in a serious way and with uh, with with uh, serious attention is 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 a for me a real treat. So, thank you. So thank you for that. I all right. Well, thanks, thanks again for having me on, on the show. I think it's a remarkable show, a really wonderful concept that you've brought to life. Oh, well, th thank you a lot for that. I, we, I try, you know, I do my best, and, this, and here we are. So thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so, so much, much. Mitch.